Hi, welcome to Security Theater, a podcast on latest research in international relations and security studies. My name is Filip Edus and today we're talking to Dr. Rok Supancic, an associate professor from University of Ljubljana. Uh, Rok, um, you're ha- currently working on a project called Repast. Can you please tell me more about this research project? So, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, Repast is a research project um, which focuses and explores uh, security issues in um, eight European states. Two states are not in the EU and six states in the European Union. Um, And this is the project uh, which researches actually how um, troubled past resurfaces today in various domains of social life. So we apply the same methodology uh, and we, as I said, in eight states uh, and we research um, politics then we research uh, media, uh, media as a second field. Um, then we research uh, arts and culture. And then uh, at the very end, uh, we also research history. So official history and oral history. Um, as you know, Europe is full of conflicts, um, which um, did not end actually. I mean, a lot of them ended in the past, but uh, um, they resurfaces. They resurface today, um, and uh, the impact on the impact on um, everyday life is uh, uh, quite heavy, un- uh, unfortunately. And so this is basically um, this is basically about the research project. Mm-hmm. And recently, you have published uh, a paper in Southeast European uh, and Black Sea Studies, a very well-known journal. Uh, which is entitled Ethnic Distancing Through Aesthetics in Bosnia and Herzegovina, appraising the limits of art as a peace-building tool with a socio-psychological experiment. Wow, this <laughs> sounds like a very exciting um, title, and I'm sure paper. Can you tell us more a- about it? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I must say that this is, uh, this is one of the outputs which I um, really, uh, really liked, not because we made it, but because it's it's really um, intriguing. Um, so what we did, um, as you know, in peace building and also with the international donors and so on, um, donors are quite eager to uh, fund the project which, which are related to, uh, uh, which in this way or another uh, deal with arts and culture. Because, you know, a lot of people think that Okay, if um, people would uh, leave their, let's say, ethnic, narrow, narrowly defined identities and move um, up and transcend this, you know, let's say, um, earthy, earthy, earthy uh, identities and unite on this universalistic uh, level of arts and culture, that this would per se, you know, bring various, uh, let's say, ethnic groups together and they would no longer be interested in this, you know, ethno-political stuff. Um, we want to challenge this assumption. I mean, we, we do believe that arts and culture is, of course, very important, but um, our, our motivation was um, to, to explore more uh, how, um, actually, if arts and culture really bring people together. Um, so, uh, the way how we wanted to, to do this was was only possible uh, via a uh, psychological experiment. Um, you know, it's if if uh, had we applied some, let's say, usual methods in uh, security studies and like I don't know um, surveys or interviews, and if you would ask people, so um, do you think that arts and culture bring people together? You know, we would get answers. Of course, we could publish a paper, but it's I'm, I mean. We don't know what the value of this this, this data uh, would be. So we employed uh, we employed um, uh, so, uh, social experiments, so to say. We relied on uh, literature in social psychology, of course. And um, uh, so what we did, we took one piece of art. Um, so uh, I invite everyone to read the paper, of course. Um, uh, and, and this piece of art was then masked in ethnic. Um, we made we made this uh, piece of art uh, ethnic. Mm-hmm. So to be to be more uh, plastic, um, 
the picture, actually it's, uh, its installation, which was done by, uh, by uh, a Serb, Bosnian Serb um, uh, artist uh, Mladen Miljanovic. Uh, he agreed that we can use his uh, arts for, for this experiment. So we masked this uh, piece of uh, this installation uh, into, we, we, yeah, as I said, we made it ethnic. So one group of students received information that this uh, installation was done uh, by Bosnian Serb author, uh, so Mladen Miljanovic, and it's, this was as, as it is. Then a second group of students got information that this uh, piece of art was uh, done by uh, Mevludin Shehic. So a name which uh, invokes, okay, that author is Bosnia, right? And then the third group of students got information that the uh, installation was done by uh, Ante Šimić uh, from Mostar, you know, uh, sort of from Shiroki Brijek, actually, so the Croatian, the Croatian guy, right? And uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to learn whether Bosniaks would evaluate the Bosniak author higher comparing to Serbian author or Croatian, Croatian, uh, Croatian artist. And um, what was, what was uh, quite intriguing, um, uh, we learned at the very end, we did experiment at uh, four or five universities uh, around Bosnia and Herzegovina, and we learned that people did not evaluate, um, so that having the name did not invoke did not invoke any kind of, um, let's say, ethnic feelings. So, in some in some examples, we we even learned that uh, th that Bosniaks evaluated a Serbian author better than if the author was Bosniak. And how do you explain these results? Actually, we uh, our uh, so numerous. Uh, we had like around 130 um, 130. Um, um, participants. Um, this very last uh, um, re result, um, we, do, we do not dare to explain because we don't think that uh, numerous, numerous was high enough. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was just a coincidence and uh, we tried to do some additional statistical analysis how this could be explained but uh, as I said uh, I, I do not dare to, to explain this. I don't know. Maybe it was Pure, pure coincidence. And maybe the newer generations in Bosnia have different feelings towards uh, ethnicities and, and uh, the conflicts of the past. Maybe it's also up to that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, we would want that this would be the case, of course. Um, but uh, I have, I mean, we, we do have some data which point in this direction. Mm -hmm. um, for example, let me explain that, uh, so how we did this experiment. Um, um, we separated, uh, we separated um, uh, students uh, in, in the uh, amphitheater um, in different uh, groups, but they did not know what the motivation and what the rationale uh, of the social experiment uh, mm -hmm. was. Um, of course, this raises a couple of uh, ethical issues, which we had to mitigate, of course, mm -hmm. and we explain in the paper how, how we did this. Um, but uh, but um, what I wanted to say is that, um, um, yes, people, uh, at the end, when, when we collected the, the, the um, questionnaires that they were given, and when we revealed what the experiment, uh, what the rational exp experiment was, um, actually, um, people were people were not even able to recall the name of the author. Mm -hmm. So you know, our presumption was that uh, when we would ask them, when they would not have information of the author uh, in front of them anymore, that they would immediately say, "Okay, um, the installation was done by Mevlodin um, Šehić or well, by Ante Šimić, and so on." But when we asked the students, so who did the installation? Can you remember? You know, answers went in directions such as, mm, I don't know, someone from Banja Luka or someone from Shiroki Brijek or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there were really, I don't know, maybe five or six students who were able to, to, to recall the name. Mm -hmm. You know, so 
this, this made us um, quite, um, quite positive, that ethnicity did not trigger the immediate reaction. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's extremely interesting. Uh, uh, one explanation could be that uh, students and general population is able to compartmentalize. When it comes to art, ethnicity doesn't matter that much. But when it comes to politics, immediately the ethnic uh, buttons are pushed and uh, people kind of uh, start uh, noticing mm -hmm. uh, who is from which community. Just, yeah, could be, wild, could yes. be. Our intention is also that, you know, we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to do the same experiment, I mean, the same methodology, also in other countries of troubled past. Mm -hmm. uh, we already have talks to, to do this kind of uh, research also in Kosovo, mm -hmm. you know, where we believe that, you know, people would immediately um, remember um, so yeah, it was Gezim from Pristina, or I don't know, um, Marko from, from uh, Mitrovica, um, that they would remember this. But we also thought that this would be the case also uh, regarding Bosnia, but it was not. Mm. So we would see. Excellent. Uh, definitely a recommendation to our uh, listeners and to our watchers to, to read the paper in full. Uh, now, the EU spends significant uh, resources on research and security. Uh, these days, a new EU research framework, Horizon Europe, uh, which will set priorities for the next few years, will be published. Do you have any information on the research topics that will receive funding this time around? Um, yeah, this will be, um, so the calls will be published um, very soon, or maybe they have already been published. Um, um, yeah, there will be some topics which would uh, where researchers would have a, so from southeastern Europe uh, would have you know possibilities to, to collaborate um, because you know the EU is allegedly about you know, tolerance um, democracy um, liberal values as well and uh, so all these are the topics which are you know a little bit um, have some challenges here in southeastern Europe. So, on the one side, I mean, for societies, it's apparently not a good thing to that you know we have to deal with these topics uh, again and again. But on the other hand, from uh, from research perspective, so researchers um, could benefit from from disadvantages these societies are facing because partners from Central Europe, Western Europe. Um, would need, you know, research here, and uh, I think that it's um, time. Um, so the time to to, to seek for consortia uh, is uh, not tomorrow, but uh, yesterday. So mm -hmm. now it's time. Yeah. Uh, Repast uh, is funded through Horizon 2020. Yes, and I know that you have been involved in several other Horizon 2020 funded mm -hmm. projects. Uh, what has been your experience in in this big consortia? And what are the challenges for small, relatively kind of peripheral universities from Southeast Europe and Eastern Europe uh, to take part in those big projects? <clears throat> One challenge is definitely um, uh, is um, I mean what what I noticed is that um, usually administ administrative support uh, is not as good as comparing to to central or western european uh, universities um, when it comes to researcher researchers um, usually there are no big problems i mean in, in a lot of cases researchers from so-called peripheral states are more motivated because they see um, this kind of projects as a you know tool to expand networks and so on so with the researchers usually there is no problem but you know with administrative issues um, not all universities and think tanks and so on in, in southeastern Europe have uh, have this um, you know people who can who can support um, this kind of research who can do the budgets calculate you know which costs are eligible which are not eligible so I this think is sometimes this, more complicated yeah. than the research itself. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah yeah for example I come from University of Ljubljana um, Faculty of Social Sciences uh, we have basically we have two people who are really well trained they know how to do stuff but you know they 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 have to deal with I don't know 20 or 25 projects 
you know so i need to, so we need to wait a lot like a week or 10 days that they find time to to you know get to our uh, issues but i don't know comparing to central western european states you know they have a lot of people who, who know first they know how to write proposals they have people who are you know whose work is to support uh, research endeavors and the research projects and so on um, um, so i think uh, ministries of education science and so on um, should allocate uh, a lot of budget for this kind of um, let's say soft skills that uh, people learn how projects are written um, that i don't know money is given to um, or that money is secured for at the end of proofreading um, graphic material uh, and these kind of issues which are at the end you know they bring two or three points and you know sometimes these two or three points are you know accepted or crucial for the success rejected. yeah, yeah. Um, let me ask you a question about the policy or political engagement of scholars um, you come from slovenia and slovenia has somewhat similar seems to me uh, kind of experience uh, when it comes to this issue as, as, as Serbia. Uh, in Western Europe and especially in the States, professors and researchers extremely rarely get involved in, in, in politics. Um, on the other hand, in Eastern Europe and in, in Serbia in particular, I'm sure for that, uh, many professors uh, you know, either incline or tend to uh, work at some point either as ambassadors or they engage in political parties. Uh, many of them are activists uh, also in NGOs. Uh, where is the right balance between the two in, in your view? <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, usually we say that it is a good question when we don't know what to answer, right? But, okay, um, I think, look, um, being um, politically engaged does not mean necessarily to go through these usual means of politics like ambassadors or political parties and so on i think scholars um, i mean especially us who are this in security issues um, look if we write an op-ed for article for for newspaper this is already some sort of engagement mm -hmm. right Furthermore, you know, if you do your job well as, as a professor here in the amphitheater, uh, you know, and you somehow, I don't know, motivate students or, or uh, teach them how to do good research or teach them how, I don't know, that democracy is an important thing. Of course, it has a lot of problems, right? But that, you know, this about values, you know, this is already another type of engagement. We don't need that all of us is on barricades shouting, you know, uh, down with this president or another president and so on. Um, but yeah, you know, as, as Pericles uh, put it, you know, if you don't want to engage with politics, politics will um, engage with you. So um, we, cannot, we cannot escape this. Perfect. Um, let us uh, round up with uh, a question that we intend to ask all our interlocutors in the future. Uh, and since you're the first interlocutor, you will be the first one whom, whom we will ask this question. Uh, based on your research uh, experience, what are some most exciting questions to look for in the future for security and peace, peace researchers? Mm -hmm. Where would you look at? What, what is your advice to mm -hmm. future researchers? What mm. to study? Mm. Wow, yeah, uh, with the uh, with the development of uh, certain um, academic fields uh, in in last five or ten years, um, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things that that could be researched. Um, but what what uh, drives me forward, uh, you know, is um, for example. There are some fields which are not, um, which were a no-go zone 10 years ago. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, no one would imagine that neuroscience would, you know, enter peace building and security issues. Now, you know, neuroscience is, you know, a fancy thing. Uh, 
all, all over around, you know. So this, this is one thing, I mean, it also motivates me in a way. Um, then what else do we have? Uh, in southeastern Europe, in, during, during my research visits, um, you know, I encountered a couple of things uh, that I didn't have time to, to research because, you know, working on a project means that, you know, you have to, you know, write reports, deliver us and stuff like that. But we encountered some spots that we would really like to research. And one, one uh, example that I discovered recently uh, is the village of Balvine. Have you heard of Balvine? No. Yeah, you see? Um, so this is a village in uh, Republika Srpska, so in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. A village which has about, uh, I think, 1,000 inhabitants. Um, and in this village is interesting because uh, if, if my preliminary, preliminary data is correct, um, a, a violence between uh, Bosniaks and Serbs who populate this village still uh, never happened. Mm -hmm. You know, so can you imagine that during the 90s when, you know, Bosnia was and Herzegovina was, was burning, um, people there were, so Serbs were, you know, saving Bosniaks, um, you know, uh, which was very difficult, you know, they risk their, their own lives, of course, but uh, if as I said, if my data is correct, you know, people still live uh, very well with each other and so on. And you know how this is related to, to the troubled past. Um, if, if, if I understood the, the village correctly, um, is that during the Second World War, when the Ustasha were around, right, when they were trying to, you know, uh, massacre uh, Serbs, uh, it was Bosniaks who were saving Serbs mm. back then, 67 years ago, you know, and this goes through, um, um, you know, from generation to generation, you know, that we live in Komšiluk and stuff like that, that we need to, to help each other. Um, of course, we thought the same for Bosnia 30 years ago, you know, that no war cannot happen here because, you know, we are brothers and sisters and so on, but the war happened. Of course, Balvine is um, not a strategically important town. If it was a strategically important town, you know, even the best Komshi looks and friendships, uh, I don't think uh, this could prevent, you know, uh, violence. So, you know, this kind of, this kind of examples are something which are really worth researching. Um, good topics for, um, for also for, you know, students from here. Um, it's not expensive, you know, to go there to, to do research, you know, interviews like that. Or maybe another another um, a, a town which is also interesting, um, if if uh, if it comes to Kosovo, you know, everyone knows Mitrovica, you know, and the issues around Mitrovica and so on, and you know these interethnic issues. Uh, but uh, there is a town of Kamin, Kaminica, Kosovo Kaminica, Kaminica in the eastern part of um, Kosovo. And it's interesting um, that, uh, I don't know if this is still the case, but uh, deputy, uh, deputy of mayor uh, uh, is or, or was a Serb. Um, and this is not because, you know, constitution or some laws would say that this should be the case. But uh, uh, I read in an interview with the mayor uh, is that, you know, it's very normal that, you know, that they collaborate well. Uh, you know, so why is this the case? If 50 kilometers away, you know, people a couple of years ago dared to cross the bridge. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that you know, Kamenica is a perfect example of co cohabitation or uh, or coexistence. But you know, these are some things that um, not far away that uh, could be researched. I think. Thank you for uh, drawing our attention to these uh, amazing ideas. And it seems to me that all your research ideas are actually sparking hope and optimism, which I think is another uh, kind of a positive function of uh, social scientists. We should not be only kind of uh, all doom and gloom, but also f uh, find some uh, examples of cooperation and try to explain it. Anyways, thank you, Rock, so much for being our guest. Thank you to talking to the security theater and uh, I would also like to thank our uh, watchers and listeners uh, for being with us. Stay tuned and see you next time. <laughs>